Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, Ben Pakulski. This is the Muscle Intelligence Podcast, getting into all the aspects that integrate into living your greatest life can be like diving into the deep end and not really being able to see where you're going. There's so much. But a simple construct for you is a simple understanding that we have a body, you have a mind, and you have a soul. And these are three aspects you've heard before. It may sound cliche, but ultimately living your greatest life means knowing and understanding and ultimately connecting with your body, your mind, and your soul. And today's podcast is a deep dive into connecting with your mind. You know that I absolutely love the idea of creating a powerful, strong, adaptable, deep thinking mind, a mind that ultimately thinks about thinking, this meta level awareness, and an amazing friend of mine and world-renowned psychiatrist joins me today, Dr. Mike Militech, and we have an amazing conversation on Mike's incredible past, how in you know, call it the curse of being an overachiever allowed him to pursue incredible things in his life while still being under significant amounts of stress and duress psychologically. And you'll hear it. And from the outside, you're like, man, you were accomplishing everything in the world. How could you possibly have been stressed or um, worried? The reality is I think a lot of overachievers experience that is either you feel like there's more to be done or you're putting way too much in your plate and you feel like you can't keep your head above water or you feel like, gosh, there's so much more that I want to do and I'm not doing enough. And there's so many different psychological framings that uh, overachievers and underachievers are experiencing that can sometimes lead to psychological limitations and ultimately battles with yourself and your mind. And Dr. Militech has become a world-renowned expert in helping pro athletes, high achievers, entrepreneurs, executives who are transitioning their life, like me, uh, to do something different, to ultimately find your true purpose. And I have some off recording, interesting conversations, some deep esoteric conversations about living in alignment with your soul and what that looks like and how to find that. But for today's conversation, we're gonna talk some interesting, interesting tactics and strategies around ultimately helping you to live at peace with your mind, to allow your friend, your mind to be an ally and a friend rather than a nemesis behind the gates. And that's a really important thing because I think a lot of us live with a default mode of thinking that maybe doesn't always support us. And there are ways and tactics and strategies to help you overcome that default mode of thinking. Something happens, you automatically have this reactive mode of thinking, don't you? We have it, I, I have it, we all have it. But here's the crazy thing, you can change that. So if that default mode of thinking isn't there to empower you right now, we can start addressing that and implementing strategies to change it. And that's one of the means of, or one of the topics of conversation today with Dr. Militech. We also get into a number of other amazing strategies to help you live your greatest life. Today's podcast is brought to you by my favorite Bubs Naturals. It sits on my counter every day when I wake up with a smile on my face excited to have my tea or my coffee. I'm also doing an intelligence tea now, which is the same ingredients, except I'm using a rooibos tea. Um, so it's just every day I'm putting two heaping scoops of the MCT powder from Bubs. I'm putting one large serving of lion's mane. I'm putting a little bit of collagen in there from Bubs. I had a little drop of, of alpha GPC, which I get a liquid, which has a bit of a sweetness to it. It's just my amazing blissful way to start my day with a nice warm beverage, especially when it's cold outside. So I highly suggest you guys pick up your MCT from Bubs, your collagen from Bubs, and let's get to optimizing our minds with Dr. Mike Militech. Don't forget to use the code BEN when you head over to bubsnaturals.com. Get hooked up because we love Bubs, their mission, their message, and they're part of our family. So take care, guys. Enjoy the show. Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike, my good friend, who I've known for a long time and look up to, uh, I'm so grateful to have you here. And as we just um, mentioned prior, prior to recording, um, you, I asked exactly how you want to be introduced, and uh, you've got a lot of designations. So I thought it'd be good if you did it. <laughs> well, thanks, man. It's a pleasure to be here. It really, truly is. I've been looking forward to it for a while, and I'm uh, glad we finally got the chance. So Me too. Um, Anyway, yeah, I at this point, at this point, I call I call myself a neuropsychiatrist, and 
I have certifications, board certifications in psychiatry, functional neurology, but I do a little bit of differentiation because I look at the entire nervous system and not just uh, the brain and the neurotransmitters that are there. But I'm also um, board certified in an advanced and an advanced fellow in um, in uh, regenerative and uh, integrative medicine as well. So that is a mouthful, I know. Yeah. But, uh, and an extremely successful athlete who did he didn't quite make the Olympics, but you, you were qualified for the Olympics, and uh, you're all around an underachiever, right? That's what we decided. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> I said too driven, but okay. Yes. Well, so that's an interesting thing, right? And you and I were speaking just prior to recording, and you and um, you expressed this reality of when you were in university, you were trying to get your your undergrad done in two years instead of four. At the same time, training for the Pan Am Games where you got silver, um, and you you just thought you were too driven. Now, and as I, as I laugh. Um, Many people in the audience go, that's a, that's a terrible problem to have, sarcastically, right? But um, as I know, and as you know, there's a lot of people out there who have something that's driving them to do so much all the time that it literally becomes a breaking point. And uh, I'd love to hear your story about how that kind of came to tip. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I really got into serious, um, serious and heavy training as an undergrad, and I was 18 years old going to... Uh, Western University, and I was all I was aware of feeling a lot of stress at the time, and that I was putting myself under it. But but it was only something as athletes think about to get through, and how do we get through this? How do I study for the next exam? But also, how do I prepare for the next competition? How do I arrange my training, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And um, got into uh, got did get into med school early, and in fact. Um, Things started to go even better, and I was silver medalist in the Canadian Championships as a third year, and then I won gold in fourth year. Um, but all during that time, I, I mean, it was such a drivenness that I was allowed to bring my weight equipment into a hospital room. So I was literally taking call and seeing very sick patients uh, to, throughout the night, and then stopping and working out in, in my little gym that I had constructed in the hospital. So I want to reverse into this a bit. And I was going to ask you before the call, but I thought, wait, where did that come from? Because, you know, I'm curious if you've ever dissected that. Is that something that came from, you know, is it a toward behavior? Is it a, is it a way behavior, uh, meaning moving toward greatness or moving away from pain as a child? Or is it just something you think that was in your nervous system? Because clearly each of your three children are incredibly successful, incredibly driven. Is it something that's just genetic for you guys? Or is it something that uh, you're actually um, building in with nurture? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think about it a lot. In fact, talk to them about it. Um, I really believe that they are, you know, there, there's a high bar of expectation for them. There's no doubt about that. But the expectation was set very early on that they just absolutely, whatever it is they do, then they can do whatever they want, whatever they love, but they have to commit to it 100%. And so the, the the expectation is you give everything you have to the thing you love and want to do. Um, but beyond that, it was to keep them happy and healthy. And what if they didn't, Mike? Well, I was really clear with them. So I, I gave them opportunities. You know, uh, Sam is right in the bubble of uh, being on uh, uh, Pittsburgh Penguins making the team or not making the team. But uh, so there, as an example, I went out of my way to get him extra coaching, to get him uh, the best, arguably the best performance trainer in the world. Yeah, you know, for sure. sure. I don't think it's arguable. I'll, I'll <laughs> <be the best laughs> um, and provided so much more. So, but it was very clear that, hey, if hockey is what you want to do, I'm going to provide everything I can. If you put your full effort in, if you don't, then those things, um, I, I'm not going to put the effort, I'm not going to give you what I'm telling you because I'm not going to work for you as a dad. My job was to work for you as a kid, but I'm not going to put that same commitment in. Same thing with Kyle, my older son. Um, he's, he was the academic one and saying he wanted to go to a private school, an expensive private school that I couldn't afford at the time. But if he didn't work his hardest in going through there, then mm -hmm. you're going to go to public school then. 
So there was always a quid pro quo in there. And so they were taught the re that kind of responsibility very early on. For me, it was something very different. For me, I, I honestly didn't have any parenting uh, growing up that was nurturing, that was loving, or that was uh, sort of life enhancing. So I had to kind of learn it on my own. And there, I, I had a background of real trauma that I had come from. And I think it was being able to take the pain of the trauma that I had been living in and converting it into an energy, uh, something that Nassim Taleb calls anti-fragility. Yep. But also people uh, like Bessel van der Kolk and so on talk about a transformation of trauma. I was living that without knowing it. So because of the degree of pain, it sort of was proportional to the energy then that I had to expend. So there were no barriers that I felt I, that I was going that were going to stop me because of that inbred energy. So I'm I'm hoping I will tell, but I'm hoping that the way I raised my kids is very different than right. the way I had to grow up. So there's an interesting thought there, and you know, you and I seem to have similar pasts, and I don't know yours exactly, but it sounds like there's a lot of embedded trauma as mine mine was, and we both managed to transmute that into something that drove us. Um, and whereas your kids are still achieving success through the opposite end of the spectrum, what we'll assume is relatively opposite of the spectrum. Uh, fast forward that to, um, you know, the, the point where they are experiencing some type of psychological, um, I don't know what the word is, but psychological barriers or, or uh, being overdriven. You know, do they experience overdriven or are they uh, equipped with the resiliency and, and the psychological skills? to uh, work through it themselves, right? So they're extremely driven people. Do they ever come to you and go, Dad, I feel like I'm taking on too much. I don't know what to do. Or do you tend to only get that from the people who weren't given the skills when they were young? Yeah, again, a great question, Ben, because um, that's, it, it's so hard to tell. There's not a, a, an either or. And, you know, no matter how good a, a, an experience we feel we're giving our kids, they're still it's always subjective. They're, she's always subjective and they're going to carry stuff forward with them. Yeah. Um, and some of the stuff that my kids have been through, you know, I've been divorced. And some of the stuff that my kids have been through has not been pleasant either. So what I've tried to do, though, along the way is say, hey, life is tough. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be um, stuck a lot of times. You're going to feel these forces, both conscious and subconscious, that are going to pull you away from what you want to do. And you've got to be able to be aware and present to recognize when those forces are pulling you away. So I've tried to embed in them, in their development, this sort of capacity to be able to be self-observant and to know when they're under the influence of some kind of conscious or subconscious force. So hopefully those kinds of tools as they move forward will be accessible. At the same time, you know, you and I have been touching on the power of the unconscious brain and mind. A lot of times we don't know when we're caught in a pattern like that. Nope. Um, you know, for example, and again, I don't want to overuse my kids here, but, you know, Sam last year, he was about to be called up to the Penguins and he went into a slump and his slump consisted of overpassing, being too nice on the ice. And what we kind of uncovered was his fear of not being liked, which he was kind of overdoing. So in other words, sports is such a crucible for bringing our unconscious conflicts up into our our play and our performance. Right? Yeah, Sam and I Sam and I had breakfast a couple of years back in Toronto, and I said one of the first things I said to him was like, "Why don't you just go up and punch the first guy you meet in the mouth and, <laughs> and get it out? <laughs> just go get it out, man! Like tomorrow will be nice. Like you have to you have to just go the complete opposite direction. That might not have been the best advice, but it's hard. the best advice. <laughs> Everybody feels that about him. He makes everybody happy, but you can't play in the NHL when somebody's trying to take off your head or take your job every day. When I, when I was, that's what I did when I was a hockey player. When I was pissed off. I was like, I don't know who's going to get it, but whoever crosses my path is going to get it. Gonna get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of success, right? I mean, it's knowing how to take that aggression and use it in your service, too. Yeah. Anyways, we're going to a rabbit hole, but um, so. 
you went down a path of helping high level performers um, to access their greatest self and overcome limitations. And you had a story of kind of what the, what the catalyst was, what the precipice was for you. You had a pro athlete who came to you who was basically wanting to do bad things to themselves, kill themselves. And you're like, gosh, you know, why don't you tell that story? Because you'll do a much better job. Than me. Yeah. So um, this was just after my residency was completed. And, and I, I came here and people kind of knew my athletic background I, and they knew it ahead of time. So um Right after the residency, I was starting to get referrals uh, about athletes because it really, athletes have a very difficult time. Uh, well, everyone has a difficult time being vulnerable and admitting why they need help. And athletes in particular are not wired to do that, as you know. They're not wired to break through the wall. They're not wired to uh, sort of sit back and say, hmm, that wall is too strong for me. I better get help. So um, I've been able to kind of connect with and relate to athletes um, in general because of my own history. So I got a call in the middle of the night one night, and um, a, it was a referral from somebody that was literally in the intensive care unit. It had driven, had, a team had just finished playing in Detroit, and he had taken a handful of, um, I mean, in, in an impulsive sort of gesture, he had taken a handful of tricyclic antidepressants, and tricyclic are different than the other ones because they can seriously um, cause what's called QT prolongation, which can lead into a ventricular fibrillation rhythm and death. So he was on um, he was on very close watch in the ICU because he, his heart was showing these signs of he was close close to a suicide successful suicide attempt. And I began to work with him and work with him for a number of years after that and realized that through his trauma history too, he was actually reenacting a combination of things that I could really connect to, a combination of adding energy and being able to be driven. But there was also something that felt very broken in his mind about himself, which we had to kind of go back to and say, hey, let's leave the performance stuff alone for a bit and let's go back to where we need to be. Like, who are you? Who do you define yourself as? Why do you feel the ways you do? Who do you relate to as a human being? Who do you connect with? How does hockey fit into your life? So going back and rebuilding him and looking to get him cool. You're right. So, Regardless, I mean, you, you could speak to specific um, instances or specific um, ailments, we'll say, mm -hmm. but is there a typical, um, and I can sure I know the answer, but is there any uh, thing that comes to mind as a typical um, directive you're trying to give them? Like, you know, we spoke prior to recording about this idea of, of connecting with community or connecting with a higher purpose or connecting with your why. So if you're or the listener of this, you know, taking something away from if you run into a roadblock where you're feeling down on yourself and you're feeling um, low and, and you're having a hard time psychologically, is there a particular path or process that you follow as a, as a clinician that says, hey, this is usually where I'm trying to take someone to pull them out of that hole? So um, the, you know, that's a, it's a, question that we can go really deeply on and I think it's a really important one that gets to why people have first of all uh, mental health is stigmatized as you know crazy it's only crazy people that get into trouble and babbling schizophrenics and so on that you see even on TV and in media secondly it's very very hard to be vulnerable enough to have the courage to be vulnerable enough to say, I need help, because it, in the performance world, it's especially, you know, we still have this image of the lone cowboy that can do everything on their own. Um, and, and, and trusting someone has your best interest at heart is always really hard. That was so hard for me, is because, like, I, I didn't really believe people had my best interest at heart, right? Like, I didn't. No matter who it was, if it was a psychologist or a doctor or a nutritionist, I was like, are, are they really doing what's best for me? And that was just my my belief, but I'm sure that resonates with other athletes. Well, it resonates with almost all athletes because athletes are also 
quite used to being um, exploited. Yeah. You know, I um, I met a couple of NHL guys one time in uh, at an All Star game, and we got into uh, conversation over a lot of wine and some good meals. And they they from very early on, and these were All Stars at the time. Very early on, they couldn't get in an elevator by themselves out of fear of uh, either uh, a male or a female coming on and alleging something that they were doing something. So they live and, you know, in addition to the trauma, their radars are super high and highly kind of uh, sensitized to being purged, to being used, to being manipulated in some way. So trust is a massive issue and how to gain and earn someone's trust because Look, connecting means letting somebody in. Man. It means you have to drop the defenses and the walls that are both inside you and around you enough to let somebody in. Now, once some, once you're able to accomplish that, back to your question, there's a, such a tremendous relief in feeling understood. It, the act of understanding someone with compassion and empathy and being able to convey that to somebody is the most powerful, in my opinion, the most powerful healing principle that there is. Can you do that for yourself? It's a challenge still, and it's a it's been a lifelong um, effort to work at that. But I think the when when people have this sort of um, wiring of our nervous systems, which we could get into, that occurs with early trauma. The hardest person to be compassionate with is ourselves. So we have to be continuously aware of those sort of old patterns to be too harsh on ourselves, to be judgmental, and especially to feel ashamed. Now, shame is a massive negative emotion that we tend to feel when we feel like we're not performing even psychologically up to par. Yeah. And I think shame, buried shame in athletes, is a tremendously underappreciated feeling. Do you have a approach or a strategy to help people deal with inadequacy and shame? Because I think that's extremely common. And it seems like it, it may just be something to do with, um, you know, feeling not good enough. Like uh, whatever it is, not good enough. I'm going to I'm going to be afraid or ashamed of this. And at some point, there's got to be someone who can say, "Hey, like, you, you know, again, not really comparing yourself against anyone else because that never works, but." You've done a lot of really great things. There's there's nothing to be ashamed of. Like you 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 should be proud of your accomplishments. And again, that that's not the, the frame or the terminology that needs to work. But do you have a, a psychological process of like making somebody feel less shameful or less um, inadequate about themselves? Yeah, I I do, and I, I think that the tendency um, is to say you know, or convey even unconsciously this um, you don't have anything to be ashamed of right but that, they do. that in itself feels like if someone's in a state of shame that in itself feels like you're adding to the shame so right from the beginning i say i understand how this can feel so it's how you can feel so ashamed how you can feel so humiliated how this goes against everything you've worked for or stood for so aligning yourself First of all, the steps are aligning myself through understanding of this. And I don't want this to sound mechanical because in real life, it's not, believe me. Um, aligning yourself with understanding the feeling of shame, but also the fact that they're coming to me, the fact that they've made a decision to help themselves is taking themselves out of the position of I'm depressed or I'm, I'm too anxious or I'm having panic attacks, whatever the case may be, to I'm going to stand up and be proactive in my own mental health care. So I applaud the hell out of their strength, appeal and showing them reframing, if you will, that their act of coming first to themselves and then to me is really an act of strength, which I believe 100% that yeah. it is, especially for the high performing people. So that's where I start. And I think it shows that they acknowledge in themselves that they have hope, right? Because if you didn't think you had hope, you wouldn't go. You would just be like, I'm hopeless and nobody can help me. I don't have any hope. But I think acknowledging that little glimmer of light of hope that they obviously see in themselves, even if they don't want to acknowledge it, um, I think is an important thing to acknowledge. Because we know when someone become, doesn't have hope is when usually then they'll give up. 
right? That they want to end their life. Critical point. Um, hope is so, um, again, misunderstood because sometimes the feeling that people have, again, consciously is they've lost all hope. And I tend to see a lot of people that have kind of failed in other treatments in their mind, that they've tried other treatments and they haven't worked. They've tried the medication route or they've tried a simple psychotherapy route or whatever it is. And they've tried self-help groups. They've tried different hacks. They've tried all kinds of things. And they literally feel like they've lost hope. And sometimes um, the person in the room, whether it's a friend or whether it's me as a professional, I have to be the one that carries the hope for them mm -hmm. because sometimes they can't even feel that. Now they must have it somewhere to be there. You're right. But I have to be very proactive in telling them initially, and this is probably, you know, not, not traditional theoretical psychiatry by any stretch, but I'm going to tell them that I believe in them. So I'm carrying their hope for them. And hoping they'll attach to that bed. Interesting. Um, where my brain goes, Mike, is most of these people by this point are, are caught or going down a spiral of negative self-talk. Mm -hmm. Right. It's so this this perpetuating loop of um, I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I, I don't know what to do next. I'm not sure how to get myself out of this. And then it becomes that idea of I don't have any hope. Do you have a strategy for overcoming uh, or at least breaking the pattern of negative self-talk? Um, first of all, I think people have to be aware that their self-talk is a process that they're engaging with. Whether it's positive or negative self-talk, it's something that they're controlling. So if they're starting the, ne the negative self-talk over and over again, we have to distinguish between what they're doing and who they are. In other words, the I'm a piece of crap, I'm no good, I feel bad about myself, and then the super critical one people can get. We have to make, first of all, make a differentiation. You're destroying your goodness by telling yourself about your badness. So we're re-emphasizing that the goodness is still there, but it's an act that they're performing, separating the reality of who they are as people from what they're doing to themselves. Then the next step is to help them become self-aware when they leave the office of getting into that place, of being, getting into that loop and catching it. So self-awareness allows them to catch it and then bringing in some kind of strategy or tactic like breath work or relaxation or ways to calm down your nervous system so you're not flooded with your amygdala signals. And once they, so that, you, you, the self-awareness and the uh, catching it and then dealing with the neurological overactivation and then starting to think through back to what we talked about. Is this real or am I just talking this way? And if you can begin to give people these tools and know also this is embedded in a relationship as, as we talked about. Someone is there on their in their corner with them if they're really struggling, then I'm there to help them with whatever it is in that process that they're struggling with to get in that country. So you've got somebody who walks into your office, and I just want to kind of get a context here. So we have, you know, maybe, maybe this is a correct or incorrect, and I'd love you to clarify. Um, we've got thoughts, we've got feelings, we've got emotions, and those may be the same, they may be different. Um, and then you've got, a, you've got a physiology, right? So like, a, like everything that happens... Um, whatever the physiological response is. So thoughts, feelings, emotions, and physiology. Um, is, is that all? And, and if so, is, is there an order of operations for intervention? Like, do I want to intervene with somebody's thoughts first and break their psychological habit? Do I want to start changing their physiology to then shift their emotions? Um, again, that, that's just the way my simple brain looks at this stuff. And that may be oversimplification or confusing to you. If it is, you can tell me, I can redirect the question. But um, so everyone has, there's, there's something happening at the level of thought which then elicits an emotion, which then maybe they correlate with a feeling somewhere in their body. And then there's this like overarching physiological existence. And that could be autonomic tone, that could be heart rate, that could be whatever, blood pressure. Uh, and there may be something that's missing. Uh, 
if so, let me have you correct me. But is there is there a process or an order of operation that you go through that, that has seen the greatest benefit or greatest effect in changing somebody's state? Uh, again, great question, because I'm thinking that you've identified literally different schools of, of belief and theoretical schools here. Cognitive behavioral psychotherapy talks about thoughts, uh, precipitating emotions. The more psychodynamic people, they talk about emotions as leading into thoughts. But both of them um, neglect the physiology. So in my model, I integrate all of them. And I would also add, um, probably, um, in someone we talked about ahead of time, Andrew Huberman has kind of brought this up, perceptions and sensations as well. But this goes all the way back to William James in 1890, 1900, where he said, look, if you put an Eskimo in a, in, in a safari and put him in front of a lion, he's not going to ever see a lion before, hasn't doesn't even know the word. He's going to take off and run. Well, why is he running? It's in response to his heart rate going up, his nervous system. So, answer your question, it's all of them all at once. In, in, in my model, I think that we have an unconscious, and this goes into Daniel Kahneman's work, Fast Brain, Slow Brain. We have an unconscious that processes things at literally light speed time greater than our conscious awareness does. Immediately, that sends a signal into our bodies, let's say a danger signal. Our bodies begin to react in the ways that you're talking about. We still don't know why, but now consciously we feel our heart rate increasing. We feel like something in the pit of our stomach. Now we've got all these memories embedded. So we start to have these sensations coming back into our brains, but now they meet the memories, but they meet the wiring and experiences, they meet the perceptions of the way that we see the world. And then we create our thoughts. We create these post hoc rationalizations to that entire process that just happened. And I think that that's where the main thoughts come from. Now, we can have anticipatory thoughts as we're heading into a situation. Oh, my God, i got to public speak. Shit, I'm going to be nervous. Well, you know, that that's a thought ahead of time. But I think when we're talking about these deeply embedded emotions, we have to address everything that's involved here and be very, very careful to, to consider that the thought is a reaction to the physiology, the neuroscience, and the emotions that are embedded in there. Mike, one of the most interesting things you said to me a few weeks back was how you think that modern day psychiatry has turned into a Prozac deficiency, I guess, for lack of yeah. a statement, right? And no, it's not. Um, it doesn't have to be a chemical solution. All of these things that exist outside of ourselves, we, we're ultimately becoming a victim to um, a life. Ultimately, we're saying, I don't have enough inside of me to overcome these challenges that are arising. So I'd love to have you talk about your, how that kind of then segues into your approach of, you know, why you started uh, looking for things outside of conventional psychiatry, um, you know, the typical prescription model, right? If, if it's, it's a serotonin deficiency or it's some some uh, chemical deficiency that needs to be given a prescription, and then, you know, why you started looking outside and then what interventions you're using now for those typical ailments. So... Um... And I, I started off in psychiatry in a very traditional, very bio, quote, biologically based uh, place that was very re heavily research oriented. And I was coming up at a time when people were talking and, you know, DSM was being de developed and coming up at a time when everyone was talking about these um, chemical imbalances and, and there must be a serotonin deficiency, so we'll give them SSRIs and so on. But over time and over over many years of practice, I found that those patients simply weren't getting better. And even if they were symptomatically better, they were band-aids because their life wasn't getting better. So these, uh, I began to delve a little bit more deeply into the research. And what I found was kind of dark and a little bit disturbing that at that time, uh, Big Pharma was sponsoring many, many of these drug trials um, that psychiatrists were running. They were funding people, including on all the way up to the NIH. So um, what was happening was that Big Pharma was literally creating diagnoses. And then they were going on direct-to-consumer ads, telling people that they had 
you know, you can still see them on TV now, telling them that they have some kind of chemical imbalance as a way to sell them drugs. Well, this completely, in my opinion, dehumanizes a human being. It takes away their agency. It takes away their power. It strips them from responsibility for their own care. It's also an attempt to destigmatize it for them because it says to them, oh, you're really not like the rest of the world that, that is mentally ill. But DSM says you are because insurance won't reimburse you if you don't have a mental illness code. So a patient is not. That's a, that's a very, very dark place to see people in. And they go through these multitudes of drug trials, multitudes of psychotherapy, nothing works. Okay, well, it doesn't work because the whole premise is broken and corrupt to start with, in my opinion. How's that? When you set somebody up to believe that their shyness is a social anxiety disorder or their distress because they broke up with a loved one is a major depressive disorder in order to give them drugs, then what are you doing to the person? It's a dehumanization of that person. And it takes away the opportunity for them to learn about themselves, for them to learn about the hows and the whys and their connections with the world, how they perceive the world, how they react with the world. What is it about their situation that's triggering for them? Maybe um, maybe it's earlier trauma, maybe not, but how am I perceiving these events that are actually causing this distress? All of that gets wiped out. Not to mention all of the physiology that goes with that too. We know that when you're depressed, your HPA axis goes offline. We know that the cortisol uh, response is deeply affected. We know that the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system becomes almost exclusively overactivated. We know that as a result of that, your inflammation goes up, the inflammation goes into your brain, it affects your brain. We know that there's a very powerful link between, between the two now. Inflammation also produces uh, gut symptoms and disturbs the microbiome, which then in, in turn makes the climbing out of your distress that much harder. It, it tanks your testosterone, your growth hormone, all of your rest and repair hormones. So you're no longer a person with all of these um, sort of interacting right. physiologies. You're just somebody that needs a pill. I couldn't stomach that anymore. Right. It sounds like you're saying, uh, and this um, you know, has been an awareness of mine recently, is that this, this range or this spectrum of emotions is intuitively or innately human. And um, the ability to experience them with courage should be encouraged in our society and, and supported rather than repressed. I think when you repress it, you become unfamiliar with it. And that when, that's when it becomes the demons and the, the, you know, you're just overwhelmed and you become a victim to your emotions rather than someone who's empowered to stand in your emotions. Does that sound like it may be the root of it? That's the root of it. And once, so that's the root of much of what I do then day to day. I stay in the moment with the patient to help the patient, first of all, identify and then explore deeper. I'm always saying to somebody, can you push into that a little bit more? Can you feel that a little bit more? Where do you feel that when you're talking to me about this? So helping them tolerate, first of all, identify it. Secondly, tolerate. Thirdly, finally, embrace it because emotions can be extremely powerful signals to us in our decision-making and in our knowledge about what's going on. So the more we can become our own explorers of our own minds in that way and use these emotions as something, you know, it's sort of like you talk about on your uh, when you're training. I mean, you, you can hone in on your training and um, in, in a way tolerate the pain. I mean, you put yourself through more pain in your training than, than anyone would. And, but you have to embrace that pain in order to get the result. If we can teach people to do that with their emotion in order to get to a different place, it's really transformative. 
Yeah, the, the concept of the only way through or the only way out is through, right? Yeah. And I think it's, it's culturally taboo, isn't it? It's like culturally taboo to express anger or express frustration or express uh, sadness or fear. Like you can't show that, especially, you know, men certainly can't express fear and sadness. And women certainly can't express anger and uh, frustration, right? It's this this irony of how we, we are forced culturally, it seems. That may not be everyone, but it seems that where a lot of us are um, you know, suggested or forced, however you want to propose it to repress. And then therefore that comes back later as some level of inadequacy that you're, you're afraid to express those things and you don't feel comfortable enough stepping into it because it's so foreign. It's like, you know, the first time you've ever experienced the heat of a stove or the heat of a fire would be very fearful to be a little child the first time they experience it. But as an adult, you're like, what do you mean? It's just a fire. Mm -hmm. right? it's, like it's kind of the same metaphor there, isn't it? Very similar. So repressing something will always come back if you're pushing it under it will always come back and and bite you it will always come back because it becomes a subterranean thing then that you're not aware of but during times of intense stress it will come back to hurt you secondly you're going to still have to adapt to something even though you're thinking you're suppressing it and there is huge cultural pressure in the raising even of boys and girls to do exactly what you're talking about. You know, so much, and I, I'm very interested in how we raise our young boys now because it's coming out, some of this repression that we do about not allowing our boys to fully experience what they're feeling, it's coming out in these crazy ways of aggressiveness towards women, coming out in ways of, you know, buying into crazy conspiracy theories in order to feel like they've got a tribe and coming out in some of these other ways that we're seeing politically going on in our country, I can track that all the way back into what you're talking about and how, how boys are raised. And to suppress means literal psychological death. So powerful. And, you know, I wish somebody had told me that when my son was born. I wish somebody had told me that when I was a child. Is like the necessity of experiencing the expressed emotions and being encouraged uh, to express those emotions and uh, just simply having someone to hold space for you or, or not. Like you're literally teaching them if, whether it's socially acceptable to cry or be angry or yell and how to interact with your emotions. And that's literally forming their psyche of the future. And uh, gosh, I wish this would be more common uh, knowledge. And, and it seems like it's becoming that way, Mike. Does it, does it feel like that to you or does it still feel like it's really far off the road? You're much more into that realm than I am. Yeah, I think we have still have a long, long way to go with that because the majority of people still want an easy way, unfortunately. They want to... We're uh, taught that. Right? They were taught that then. And they're still taught that. I mean, the instant gratification of the internet is uh, they're, learn they're hearing that every day. To really parent in the way that we're talking about, to really allow kids to express things, to hold their emotions, to provide that sort of holding environment of safety that you're giving them, and then to tell them how to deal with whatever the emotion is, is hard work. Yeah. It's very easier to say, go to your room, you're being a baby. Or, yeah, or <laughs> hey, go watch TV and here's an ice cream, right? This is something that happens. You're, you're sad. You go have some ice cream and watch television. You're like, what? Like, how does that become even part of the, of the solution? Uh, that blows my mind when I hear of, you know, and I get it because like it's it's hard for people, parents that can't even deal with their own emotions are, are now being thrown into the fire to deal with the children's emotions. And they're just like, I'm not sure how to deal with this. Hey, go watch TV. Go play your video game. Here's my phone. Whatever it is, I don't want to deal with this shit. And then they're going, I'm not sure why my 18 year old kid is depressed and wanting to take drugs. Well, I think I think it seems pretty obvious, but we don't we're not made aware of the correlation early in life. We need stronger voices to do that. We need stronger voices culturally. We need them scientifically. We need them sociologically. And we need them politically, for that matter. We need the voices to come out and instruct and draw those lines. They're not hard to draw to connect those dots, Ben. I mean, the example you just gave is a great one. That, you know, go and watch TV and eat, eat ice cream. Well, and you drew the line. Um, to drug taking, yeah, you, that's going to be the person that wants to put something in their bodies or something in their mouth to push away to some other the bad feeling. Bam. I mean, that's not a very difficult line or two to 
points to draw a line between. And it, it's like the social, it's the social norm, isn't it? It's like I get to interact with my children's friends, right? I've got a seven-year-old and eight-year-old, and I get to interact with their friends and with the friend's parents, and that's literally the norm. And all, yeah. all my kids will come back from the house and go, hey, daddy, this person does this. And I'll be like, this is what I have to deal with because I'm doing my best. Like I'm struggling as it is. And, and you know, I, I tend to be more self-aware than most humans. Um, but I'm, I'm now I'm struggling to have to deal with like, how the hell do I deal with that? Where my kids are coming going, why can't I do this? And they got this. And I'm like, what do I say? You know, I'm like, ah, I don't know. That's just not how we do it. <laughs> right? I usually have a better response than that. But um, yeah, it's, it's all just interesting because I get the social pressures of like, hey, my kid's seven and they have a phone. I'm like, what? Well, no. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's that's just the, the norm in America, right? It's, it's you're having to as as a parent who attaches to hopefully doing his best. Um, there's a lot of stuff, not just what happens in my home, but what happens outside the home. That and there's a lot of social pressure. Like, why isn't your kid able to watch television, or you know, why isn't your kid able to play today, or uh, why can't they have sleepovers? Well, many, many reasons, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So. Early on, I mean, you know, we touched on this right at the beginning, too. I think early on, giving kids the reasonable um, answers, they're going to, you know, they're going to be angry. They're going to be upset. They're going to moan. They're going to yell at you because they can't have the sleepover or whatever. But the principle that I have followed and the principle that I teach is give an explanation to the kids about why we do things the way we do at a level that they can understand. Mm -hmm. So you're measuring that kid's sort of emotional intelligence, if you will, and tolerance for the message in that moment. Yeah. But again, that's hard work because you're you're caught up in your own thing too. Yeah. Uh, but if you can do that and explain it all, all along the way, that explanation will go so much farther than because I said so. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's not, it's, that's not going to win the day. Man, it's funny. I always manage to bring things back to parenting because I realize, like, if we're going to change the world, it has to. It has to go. It has to start with our children, right? Like, we're all very much deep into our own unconscious and conscious. Um, but the more we can empower ourselves to understand, parenting is uh, an essential part of our evolution as a species. But I want to come back to um, your process, Mike, because you're doing amazing stuff, and you're one of the few. Um, experts in the realm of behavior and psychiatry that's also getting into the integration of physiology and helping people at a really high level to one get out of their own way whether it be a high performer who's got such high demands on themselves maybe it's a low performer who's like i'm not really sure how to get motivated and, and we talked about um, people who are transitioning from whether it be post pro sports and something new like myself or someone who's maybe transitioning out of a relationship but right now, I think in COVID, everyone's in a transition because half of people are out of a job and we're like, what the hell do we do with ourselves? Exactly. So, so what does that start to look like? And you mentioned getting connected with a few aspects of yourself. I'd love to go down that path. Yeah. Um, so, man, I, I, again, I, I look at things in totality. I'm an integrator and I, I believe in knowing as much as we possibly can about the human body and its interactions um, you know, I don't separate, first of all, body and brain. I, when I say body, I'm including, yep. uh, I, I don't separate mind body. I think that's uh, long past the, a conversation. I don't separate. But, but for you, it is. But for most people, when, when we say like body and mind, people assume they're separate. I, in my odd, my demographic doesn't ever draw the correlation. You could say, you could say mind and brain and people don't even separate those two. I don't know. It's interesting. People people don't ever think. They just they just kind of um, associate things uh, however they've been taught from day one. Well, we can go on forever. I love sure. this conversation because <laughs> critical thinking has been has been abrogated. Critical thinking has been kicked out for instant relief and reward. Yeah. And that's one of the things that when someone comes to me right from the beginning. It's really an exercise in being able to critically think about things as well as, you know, internal as well as external and linking those two. So that's the first step. Second step when they come in, I will I strongly believe in a healthy physiology making it easier for someone to deal with whatever the mental health or mental performance thing that they have to do. So I kind of do a deep dive into labs right away. So I'll do all the blood labs that I do to measure everything from the things we were talking about. I mean, all of the inflammatory markers, 
algorithms I measure. I measure neurotransmitters. I measure 24-hour cortisol. I do a deep dive into hormones, hormone metabolites, even I look to see anything and everything that may be off. I do stool samples now regularly on patients to check their microbiome. Um, I look at everything. And then I sit down with the patient and say, okay, you've told me your story. You've told me the narrative about how you get here. Let's look to see the data behind that, too. And when we show data to people, invariably, the data supports their story. Then all of a sudden, it becomes a journey of where they're interested. They, they get something that they can hold on to, but they also have a way in to be able to make some changes. So then we start to do a bottom-up approach. You know, we own in on the fleet um, and it isn't just you know 10 things that Matt Walker says to improve your uh, <laughs> your sleep hygiene is try to really get the sleep and stay asleep and why you're not sleeping so looking deeply into the whys of the bottom up I look at light um, I look at movement exercise obviously I'd love to have a long conversation with you about this and how we can do that to self-regulate um, I don't use the word diet. I use the word food choices for individuals and how to match that to the individual's physiology. I, so all of these sort of things, we can start jumping in on and correcting right away because lo and behold, there's data out there now that shows, okay, if you sleep well, if your micronutrients are back in order, if your hormones are corrected, you're going to automatically feel better. Now, let's really go to work on the mental aspect of it. But we're not going to separate the mental aspects out at the beginning either. Because if you don't turn your labs in or if you have, you know, if you have a lot of this procrastination because you're feeling depressed or whatever, we can immediately begin to say, okay, what's getting in your way? So we bring the self-awareness into the body stuff too. At the same time, I start talking to them about the pain and the stress. So we've got all these things going on, both, like I say, bottom up and then top down. And we put together, everybody gets an individualized plan about what's going to work for them. I don't bring me to them. I have, I want them to bring themselves to me. And I meet them where they're at, which makes it imperative then to be able to customize something for them. It's just theirs and theirs alone. So yeah. that's process and how I go through an evaluation. Yeah, I love that. So what you'll know, and, and uh, the, the listener may not, is in our fitness community, uh, it's become a trend lately to just individualize and prescribe hormones myopically. Like, hey, you don't feel so good. You need to stop drunk. And um, that is the equivalent of giving somebody, in my eyes, uh, the SSRI. It's not going to have the negative effects, but it's just so uh, myopic, right? And for someone to actually make a significant change in their body, testosterone is not the answer. Neither is estrogen or progesterone or DH. Like it can't just be an isolated thing. It's always like, okay, what is the, the root cause of all this? So rather than giving you the band-aid, as you referred to earlier, we have to look at, okay, what is the cause of this stuff? Why are all these things not working correctly to begin with? Is it an excess of inflammation? Is it an excess of body fat? Is it a lack of movement? Is it poor sleep? Is it too much stress? And how do we actually get into those lifestyle interventions that ultimately can give you the, the change. So maybe we're giving them just some testosterone as a, as a way to get them energized to then make the lifestyle interventions, right? And I think, I, I know you acknowledge that, but I just want the audience to acknowledge the necessity of never t- taking a myopic view. It's never a single thing. And, and, you know, I could think of, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of clinics across the country that are uh, individually prescribing testosterone to people and, or HCG or, or, or Romacin or whatever it is. Um, as just like, hey, just fix this and everything's going to be better. It never is. And it almost makes it worse because of this complex system thinking approach to the body, right? Um, so uh, that, I just wanted to acknowledge that because you do such a great job in your model of uh, looking at everything. You know, Ben, and uh, this goes back to how I feel um, the medical profession as well as the psychiatric profession has failed um, people. There have been huge gaps in uh, what a physician will use to treat a patient. And one of the gaps has been hormones. Another gap has been nutrition. Another gap has been exercise. Well, what happens when there's a vacuum? 
Then you have all kinds of people coming out with sort of these self-help things. We have self-help gurus that are, you know, everywhere swapping us. You can, each with their own hack or their or their own method or their own intervention. And to start, and hormones are a big one because uh, there are hormone receptors in the brain, and taking a hormone if you're depleted will help you feel better. But there's lots of things that will help you feel better. It, you have to look first of all, and I agree 100. percent Why is your testosterone low? And what can you do in your life with all the lifestyle changes that you can make? Your testosterone being low, it should be a thing, a signal to you to that there's something wrong with the whole system. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, amazing. And let me ask you a question. When's the book going to be out? I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. <laughs> it is. It has been started. I've got. Um, a lot of thinking that I've done, a lot of data that I've collected, a lot of patients that are being treated, and uh, the framework is being put together. Have, have you seen um, an uptick in uh, client requisitions or people coming into the office because of COVID? No, oh, tremendous, Ben. I mean, the rate of Oh gosh, everything from depression to uh, stress disorders to spousal abuse, even to um, uh, substance abuse, everything has skyrocketed. Yes, now it's suicide, trauma, and even psychosis. Uh, COVID induced psychosis is um, it, it's very frightening, and not enough attention again is being paid to. We're fighting over six hundred dollars versus two thousand dollars. Who's paying attention to people's wellness here? Yeah, nobody, right? And that maybe maybe that's why I, I honestly believe everything in the world is happening for a reason. And I think COVID is an amazing opportunity for people to start thinking differently. You're, you're forced to think differently, and there's there's a lot of people out there who are positioning themselves in a way that is going to make them completely different, completely. Uh, empower developing new skill set because there's develop, developing a business out of necessity, right? Necessity is the mother of all skill. And this is what this is. And yes, there's a lot of people who are struggling, but hopefully the struggle turns into your greatest opportunity for strength and stepping into something that empowers you to ultimately lead the world and lead a better place. Mike, you're already doing that. I'm speaking to listeners, obviously. Um, I just, I just, I, I, right now I'm already seeing it. Uh, people coming to me and going, I've got this amazing thing that I'm doing. And I'm like, Yes, and, and it, better for it, maybe it's bringing people's attention to health. And maybe that's why this is happening, Mike, is like it's going to break the pharmaceutical model because people are going to realize like, hey, no number of SSRIs is going to stop you from, from getting sick or, or depressed or uh, ultimately dying eventually unless you start taking care of yourself. And I hope this uh, incredibly challenging situation that we're going through becomes the catalyst for uh, a greater humanity, a greater um a greater conscious awareness, right? It's almost like forcing you into consciousness, I think. It's like either forcing you into a deeper unconsciousness where you're just like, I just can't deal with this and I'm going to mute it with everything I can and drugs and alcohol and food and TV and social media, or I'm going to um, keep going and, and become more aware of how this is influencing me and, and step into something that, use this as a catalyst for something better. It's an old axiom, right? That it's not... It's how we react to the things in our life that are going to define us. And if you can find a way to react to this and say, all right, this is really painful. This is really a struggle for everybody. But I'm going to see what I can do to make myself better during this time. Yeah. And people like yourself and hopefully people like myself can be seen as people who are lifting others up. Right. It's like, hey, man, we have the strength for two and we have the, the skill set to help you overcome something. And that's why we're here. And I think that's why you and I get along, Mike. And that's why we spend time chatting and, and connecting on these things to ultimately empower people with the knowledge and skill set to change their life, to step into their greatness. And uh, Mike, I'm so grateful for you being here. Is there somewhere you'd like to send people to reach out to you if they want to work with you personally? So yeah, you work with a lot of high level uh, executives, entrepreneurs, pro athletes. I, I don't know if it's like average people as well. Um, you can tell us a little bit about your business. Yeah, absolutely, Ben. Thank you. Um, I've taken this model, you know, that started off at this level um, of high performance and so on, but I've been able to scale it down. Um, when I say down, I mean broadly. And we're able to just we, to help anybody that really wants to commit themselves to this. 
with. Okay. So it doesn't, you don't have to be, um, you know, the, the sort of, um, you know, Patrick Mahomes kind of character or somebody at that level at all. A lot of this medicine is derived from that, but it's available to everybody. And um, let me think, I, I just as you know, I've just jumped on the social media in the last few months. In fact, starting with COVID, I've been off of it forever. Um, but I have a website now. It's the militexceptor.com. Um, I think my uh, my Instagram post is just my name, Michael Militic, and um, LinkedIn is Dr. Mike Militic MD. So, and if you go on my website, you can um, my emails are there as well as the office phone numbers, and I'd be more than happy to um, make an appointment or even answer questions at some point. So, um, I think the message that we're both giving today, Ben, is that we are there for people. Um, we're also there for each other. Yeah. Uh, Mike, thanks so much for your time. I will link to all of that and, and more in the show notes. I think we've talked about today. We'll be linked to you directly at muscleintelligence.com uh, slash podcast, and we will send uh, links to your website or your social, all that stuff, so people can reach you through there. Mike, uh, truly grateful. I hope you get to spend some time. We get to spend some time in the same city soon. Uh, it would be absolutely great to connect with you and, and spend more time understanding your model and your process. Love to do that, Ben. Looking forward to our next dinner. Thanks, Mike. That's a wrap, ladies and gents. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Mike Militech. Mike is a board-certified psychiatrist who lives in Michigan and is still work. well, not still, but he's working every single day from what seems like sunrise to sunset, helping people through their psychological challenges. And we all have days that are challenging. Some of us have weeks and months and years that are challenging. I hope each and every one of you feels encouraged to realize that at the end of every winter, there is always spring. If you're willing to exude and express your strength and step into that strength and realize that those dark times are always followed by bright times and you can work your way through. And, and when working your way through those, you come out with so many incredible lessons that you could pass on to yourself, your family, your friends, and others for future uh, experiences and help them to not go through these things as well. Or maybe teach them some resilience strategies on how to cope. I hope you guys love the podcast as much as I did. Dr. Mike is an incredible, incredible teacher. He's an incredible leader. I'm so grateful for his time and his contribution to our mental health. And also super grateful to Bob's Naturals for hooking you up with 20% off when you use the code Ben at bubsnaturals.com. They've got some new products coming out. They've got a fountain of youth collagen product, which is phenomenal. The ladies tend to love that one. Tastes really great in your shakes. Pick it up. Check it out. Have an amazing day. Don't wait. Do it now. Bubsnaturals.com. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.